Today I'm going to talk to you about my work on natural language understanding for events and participants in text. And so before I dive in, um, the bigger picture of my research is that I focus on three main areas. So first I work on developing uh, systems that map sentences to representations of their meaning, um, in particular to support downstream inferences about uh, events and participants mentioned in text. Uh, zooming out a bit, I'm also interested in how these events relate to one, anon one another um, in contexts broader than a single sentence. Um, but understanding uh, the relationships between um, events across sentences requires common sense uh, knowledge about the world. Uh, so I also develop work on uh, developing systems uh, that can learn about the world uh, through large quantities of text. Um, and then finally, as we build systems that learn about the world through language, um, it's been observed that these systems uh, can often pick up um, undesirable social biases. So the last part of my work focuses on uh, ways of detecting and measuring social bias in NLP systems. Uh, so in today's talk, I'm going to focus primarily on sentence level processing for events and participants, um, but I'll also touch on these two other topics uh, towards the end. Okay, so as the focus of this talk is going to be on understanding events and participants in text, um, I'd like to first establish what I mean by that. So in this example, we have an eating event. Uh, in this sentence, the cat ate the rat with its sharp teeth. Um, we have an eating event denoted by this verb ate. And we have three participants, the cat, the rat, and its sharp teeth. Um, and we'd like to be able to answer various questions about this event and these participants, such as who and what are the participants and the event? Um, what roles do each of these participants play within this event? So essentially, who is doing what to whom? Um, and we'd also like to be able to answer questions about, for example, did the event mentioned actually happen or not? Did it happen in the past, in the future, and so forth? Uh, so in the first part of the talk, I'll discuss my work on event factuality. So what is event factuality? Um, put very simply, event factuality is the task of determining whether or not some event mentioned in text actually happened according to the author of the text. So here's a very simple example. Uh, Pat watered the plants versus Pat did not water the plants. In the first case, we have a watering event that happened. And in the second case, we have a watering event that did not happen according to the meaning of the text. But of course, event factuality prediction is a lot more challenging than just a matter of determining the presence or absence of negation. So event factuality can be influenced by uh, words from many diverse syntactic or semantic categories. So of course, negation, but also adverbs can influence factuality. Pat almost watered the plants. Uh, quantifiers, Pat watered none of the plants. Uh, modal auxiliaries, Pat might have watered the plants. And of course, in this case, it's um, ex expressing uncertainty about whether or not that event happened. Uh, clause embedding verbs exhibit um, a very rich uh, set of behaviors with respect to the factuality of the embedded events. Uh, as, for example, in the differences between Pat failed to water the plants versus Pat managed to water the plants. Um, and even nouns can have an influence on factuality, um, as is in the case of Pat's watering the plants was a hallucination. So event factuality is important, uh, is of great interest in linguistics because it can shine a light on the complex interactions of uh, uh, semantic operators and how they compose up a tree. Um, but then from a more applied perspective uh, in natural language processing, event factuality can be useful for tasks like information extraction. So in this example, we have uh, this document, Merkel urges the EU and UK to find Brexit compromise. And if we were to run an information extraction system on this document, we might encounter uh, various relations, um, such as an urge compromise relation between Merkel, the EU, and the UK. Um, we might discover that Merkel is the chancellor of Germany. Um, and we might also encounter this find compromise relation between the EU, the UK, and Brexit. Um, but we wouldn't, in this case, want to actually uh, enter this particular uh, relation into our knowledge base um, because it, does not, it didn't actually happen based on the meaning of the text. So this is what uh, an example of something that uh, event factuality prediction would be uh, useful for, is determining whether or not to enter these extracted relations into a knowledge base. Um, and then more generally, um, event factuality is going to be an integral part of language understanding. Um, and we wouldn't be able to make certain inferences about situations without knowing whether or not particular important events happened. Um, so in this example, the driver crashed his car into a tree. A human reading this sentence might 
infer a variety of, um, make a variety of inferences about the situation, such as the driver sustained injuries, probably hap possibly happened, um, the car was totaled, uh, he continued driving is probably a bad inference, um, the car and the tree made contact is certainly the case. Uh, and if we compare this to the sentence, the driver almost crashed his car into the tree, uh, we're going to get a very different set of inferences about the situation based on our understanding of whether or not that crashing event happened. And then we can also see how factuality detection could be potentially useful in the context of helping, um, uh, helping dialogue and chatbot systems avoid making very silly mistakes um, like the ones that we see here. Okay, now in order to train an event factuality prediction system, uh, we're going to need to collect some data. Uh, so I collected uh, a data set of event factuality called It Happened. Um, it's the largest uh, event English factuality data set to date with about 27,000 uh, annotated predicates. Um, and it covers the entirety of the uh, Universal Dependencies English Web Tree Bank version 1.2. Uh, and so the text in the uh, English Web Tree Bank includes uh, various genres, uh, such as blogs, reviews, question answers, news groups, uh, email, and so forth, uh, and covers about 17,000 sentences. Uh, and in parallel, we have also gold uh, labeled uh, syntactic dependencies according to the universal dependencies standard. Uh, now the first step is going to be to identify the tokens in the sentence that represent events that we want to annotate for factuality. Now, because we have gold UD syntax, uh, we're going to use our predicate argument extraction system called PredPat. Um, and this is just a rule-based system on top of dependency syntax in order to extract the predicates. Um, now, of course, uh, we're going to miss certain types of events with this approach, um, such as those expressed by noun phrases. Uh, but the trade-off here is that we can do this uh, extraction directly from the syntax. So once we have the, um, the tokens identified that represent events, uh, we're going to have annotators decide whether or not those events happened. So we'll present, an anno we'll present annotators with sentences and uh, a token highlighted that represents the event. So they'll see a sentence like this, and then we'll ask them first, um, is the sentence understandable? And does the highlighted word refer to a predicate? And then secondly, uh, according to the author, is the situation referred to by that highlighted word? Um, did it happen or not, and how confident are you about that? So in this work, I'm going to compare uh, and make use of three other existing factuality data sets. Uh, one is uh, FactBank, another is a data set from the University of Washington, and uh, the third is MeanTime. Um, and so each of these data sets is going to be mapped to a unified factuality scale from minus three to three, following the work of Stanowski et al., uh, 2017. Um, and so minus three means that the annotated event definitely did not happen. Positive three means it definitely did happen. And all of the scalars in between represent varying degrees of uncertainty. So if we look at the distribution of these labels um, on the minus three to three scale over these four different data sets, uh, we see that the it happened data set in purple um, has a bit more of an entropic distribution than the other data sets. Uh, and this is likely because um, it has a, a broader genre distribution over user-generated texts, whereas each of these other three data sets is, uh, focuses on Newswire, which tends to have um, more emphasis on events that did happen. So here are just a couple examples from the It Happened data set. Uh, as you can see, we have sentences here that are uh, user-generated and a little bit more casual in style. Uh, my personal favorite sentence, I heart maxes which we have labeled as being factual. Um, OK, so moving on to the models. Um, Just a quick question. Yes. I guess you don't care about when the event happens. So if you say, give me mm. a call, that could actually happen in the future. So yeah, so uh, this, is, this is one thing that uh, is going to come down to some differences between the annotation protocols between these different data sets. Uh, so there's this question of, should we label future events as factual or not? Um, in our annotation protocol, we said, you know, it's only factual if it happened, if it already happened or is happening, um, but we're excluding future events, um, but not all of the other data sets uh, follow that protocol. Okay, so the models that I developed for this task. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to uh, investigate whether recurrent neural networks can learn to do event factuality prediction and how the topological structure of the network is going to affect its performance. Uh, 
Um, so the models that I developed for the task are a linear bidirectional LSTM, a child sum tree bidirectional LSTM, and a hybrid uh, bidirectional LSTM that combines both the linear and tree structured models. Um, and so the idea here isn't to concoct an entirely new uh, neural architecture from scratch, but rather to combine and extend components of known architectures um, in order to adapt them as best we can for this particular task, um, and in a way that is sensible given what we know about um, the computational nature of the problem of event factuality from linguistics. OK, so the first model is a linear bidirectional LSTM. And so as a standard, we're going to run two LSTMs independently uh, over the sentence, one word at a time, uh, one in the forward direction, one in the backwards. And we'll concatenate those hidden uh, forward and backward hidden states, uh, and then uh, select the concatenated hidden states that correspond to words that represent events, um, and pass those hidden states through a multilayer perceptron, um, which will give us a regression onto the minus 3 to 3 scale. Um, now, if we were only using a forward LSTM, um, we would only be able to condition on uh, previous words in the sentence. But uh, we, based on the examples that I show, we have some sense that uh, words from basically any part of the sentence could potentially impact uh, factuality. So that's why we're going to use a bidirectional model. Um, now, while we might want to model sentences according to their linear structure, we also know that they have a latent syntactic tree structure. Um, so we might want to also try encoding uh, this as an inductive bias into our model. And so that's exactly, exactly what we're going to do with the tree structured um, LSTM. Um, so in the linear case, we had the hidden state being updated as a function of the uh, input and one previous hidden state. But here, uh, now a node is going to potentially have multiple previous states. Um, previous hidden states corresponding to its multiple children. Um, and so this is reflected in the recursive update function f. So now we're going to have two um, tree structured LSTMs, one that goes in the upward direction from the uh, leaves to the root, and one in the downward direction from the root to the leaves. And again, we'll concatenate the hidden states and select the ones that correspond to um, tokens that represent events and pass them through a similar uh, multilayer perceptron regression module. And the only difference here uh, between the tree structured model and the linear model is going to be these modifications in red, where we're now having to sum over uh, previous hidden states. OK, and so then the uh, hybrid model, we're going to combine both the linear bidirectional and the tree bidirectional model, uh, concatenate the corresponding hidden states, uh, pass that through a multilayer perceptron, and train this end to end. So those are the three models that we're going to try for this task. Um, and now I'll discuss uh, how I trained these models, and in particular, uh, took advantage of multitask learning. So in multitask learning, we're going to, the general idea is that we want to train a single model uh, that to do multiple related tasks so as to induce a better representation internal to the model. Um, and in this case, we have four different factuality data sets all collected under slightly different protocols. Um, and so the idea here is that we're going to just treat each of these four different factuality data sets as a different task, um, and then proceed with a multitask, a multitask architecture. So the simple case is a single task architecture where we'll just train a separate model for each of the four data sets. Then in order to try to take advantage of all of the existing data sets, uh, all of the existing data that we have for factuality, uh, the next simplest thing that we could do would be to just concatenate all of the data sets uh, and train a single model on them, but then this is not allowing us to differentiate between the four, between the four data sets and the, um, the different protocols that were used to collect them. So the uh, multitask architecture that we'll use is going to have um, shared hard sharing of parameters at the LSTM encoder layer, and then we'll have um, separate data set specific parameters uh, for the multilayer perceptrons. And because each of these data sets are different in size, we'll also experiment with various um, sampling strategies. OK, so moving on to the results. Uh, this is the full table of results, um, which is clearly too much information uh, to present here. So uh, I'll just uh, focus on a few examples uh, that I think are representative of the broader trends. OK, so the way that we're going to evaluate this is based on the Pearson correlation. Um, between the uh, the annotated um, between the predicted scalar value and the annotated scalar value, uh, 
Um, and we're going to be looking at values primarily in the 0.8 range. So here's some of the uh, overall results for the fact bank data set. Um, so the best performing prior work here has a correlation of 71. And uh, with the simplest model, the linear bio STM, we can do much better than this um, with a correlation of 82.6. Uh, now, interestingly, um, as it turns out, the tree bidirectional LSTM does not do as well as the linear model, uh, only at 75.2. But when we uh, combine both of these models in the hybrid version, um, we're able to do just a tad better than the linear model by itself at 83.1. Uh, so each of these models is outperforming prior work, but the best performing model is the hybrid model. Um, and then when we uh, moving to the uh, multitask setting, um, we can see that overall performance is even higher than in the single task uh, model, but we also see a similar pattern where the uh, linear model is outperforming the tree model, but the hybrid model is outperforming both. And then um, now we can see the results of the it happened data set. And as you can see, uh, overall, uh, this data set is a bit harder um, than the fact bank data set. And I think the main reason for this is that the, um, the informal user-generated nature of the data. OK, so I've shown that we can train models that achieve very high correlation with human judgments on factuality data sets. Um, but I've also done some uh, follow-up analysis with synthetic examples that can reveal some of the uh, limitations of these models. So in particular, these models seem to have trouble with a number of lower frequency lexical items that are implicitly ne encoding negation. So for example, someone faked that something happened. The model is not able to detect that um, that means that the something didn't happen. Um, so this would be an example of um, a lexical item that doesn't occur that much in the training data, but is implicitly encoding a negation. Um, and then at the bottom, we have, for example, someone didn't hesitate to do something uh, the model is picking up on this negation, and so it thinks that uh, something was done, but in fact didn't hesitate to uh, means that it, it was done. So there are a few examples here that the model is still being tripped up on. Uh, so I think in future work it would be very interesting to find ways of training models that can learn uh, these low frequency items um, from this type level annotation, uh, from this, this type of synthetic data. OK, so uh, now that I've talked about events and whether or not they've happened, uh, I want to talk a little bit about participants in events and the roles that they play. So in particular, I'm going to discuss my work on semantic proto roles. Yeah. Um, no, I, I haven't. Um, I think part of, part of the problem is that it's, it's not clear. So I mean, that would be an interesting thing to try. It's not entirely clear if this is something that could be, um, like in the example of someone faked that something happened, it's not clear that there is any compositional, <laughs> like that any sort of breakdown of that word would help you further. But that's a good idea. Okay, so um, so moving back to uh, so now we're going to talk about semantic protorole labeling. Um, so moving back to the original uh, example that I had at the beginning of the talk of the cat ate the rat. Um, if we wanted to answer the question of who is doing what to whom, um, we have an NLP the task of semantic role labeling to help us with this. Um, and so in SRL, uh, our task is going to be to assign an abstract categorical role type to each of the participants in an event such as agent, patient, or instrument. Uh, so in this example, we would see that the cat is labeled an agent, which means that it's the participant that's doing the eating. The rat is the patient. It's the participant that's being eaten, and so forth. Um, now, SRL is facilitated by the existence of uh, various annotation resources, like FrameNet, uh, PropBank, VerbNet, ACRE, and so forth. Um, but building these resources uh, requires first establishing an ontology of categorical semantic roles, uh, such as this role hierarchy from VerbNet. So uh, developing these ontologies is a slow and expensive process, and annotating data under these ontologies 
then also requires uh, trained experts. Now, conveniently, uh, some linguists, um, in particular David Doughty, have argued that it might not actually be appropriate to model semantic roles as categorical objects in the first place, um, that we can actually better think of these as cluster concepts. And um, in particular, Doughty gave us some ideas of what these cluster concepts might actually look like. So one cluster of arguments tends to have properties like uh, uh, volition or sentience, and these are the so-called proto-agents. And the other main cluster tends to have properties like undergoing a change of state or being causally affected by another participant. And these are the uh, so-called proto-patients. So what Dowdy is suggesting is that we should actually be thinking of agents and patients um, and so forth, not as these monolithic categories, but instead in terms of a decomposition into the properties that they tend to exhibit, um, but strictly speaking aren't required to. So in order to operationalize Dowdy's theory in a computational setting, um, we are going to need to collect some data. Um, so given a sentence like, the antibody then kills the cell, we will um, underline the uh, word that corresponds to the predicate, um, highlight the, uh, the participant or the argument, and then ask annotators to answer questions about the participant in the context of that event uh, or, or predicate. So uh, this here is an example of the annotation for the property of awareness. Um, so we would ask the annotator, how likely or unlikely is it that the antibody is aware of being involved in the killing? Uh, and the annotators will respond on a subjective likelihood scale from one to five. Uh, but we'll also have questions for each of the other semantic proto for, for each of the other proteral properties. So this is the full current full set of the uh, properties that are annotated for in the semantic proteral data set. Now, of course, at any point in time, we could also decide that we'd like to extend this inventory of properties. Um, and an advantage to this property-based approach is that we could layer on additional property annotations uh, without, in the future without having to go back and modify any of the existing annotations, which would not be the case if we were working under um, a, a strict ontology. Okay, so now we can think of semantic proteral labels as um, a vector of properties rather than a single categorical label as we would have in semantic role labeling. And we can convert these, uh, the Likert valued vectors uh, to binary value just simply by drawing a threshold. Um, so in this example sentence, we can see that uh, the cat acts with volition, uh, the rat undergoes a change of state, it's destroyed, uh, and so forth. So from this data set, um, yes? Is it the case that in any particular sentence, um, this particular argument has a, has a uh, categorical role and your work is analyzing the distribution of that, of how a particular um, argument can exist in different sentences? Or is, are you, or is the argument from uh, Dorothy that in a single sentence, a argument can take on multiple. The, okay, so the argument is that uh, arguments, it's not always clear whether an argument is an instance of one category or another. There are a lot of cases that tend to sort of fall between the cracks or uh, it's not necessarily easy to make a, a clear cut categorical decision but we can make fairly stable judgments about each of these individual properties. And, we have, and, we, and the idea is that um, arguments tend to uh, cluster around um, having certain sets of properties. Uh, and so we, we're labeling those at the, um, at the token level. So, um, so from this data set, um, we can now uh, establish a new task. Um, it's a multi-label task of semantic proto-role labeling. Um, so given a sentence and a predicate argument pair within that sentence, um, we're going to want a system to be able to predict the scores for each of the proto-role properties. So in this example, we'd have to make three sets of predictions, uh, one for the cat, one for the rat, and one for its sharp teeth. Okay, so following the development of this task, uh, I also developed a neural model that performs these predictions, um, which I call a neural Davidsonian model for reasons that I will explain briefly or shortly. 
Um, OK, so here's the neural architecture that I created for the task. So first, we're going to uh, use uh, pre-trained word embeddings for each of the words in the sentence. And we'll run a bidirectional LSTM over those embeddings. Um, now, recall that at any point in time, what we're trying to do is to predict the protorole properties uh, with respect to a specific predicate argument pair in the sentence. So at this juncture in the network, we're going to take the hidden states that correspond to the syntactic head of the predicate and the syntactic head of the argument and concatenate them. And then we'll pass this through a shared linear projection uh, with parameters that are shared across all of the protoroll properties. And then we'll pass it through uh, separate linear projections for one for each of the different protoroll properties. And from this, we'll get predictions for each of the protoroll properties with respect to the predicate argument pair in the sentence. And from these predictions, now we can uh, formulate a Neo-Davidsonian-like representation of the event. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. Um, and what actually ties this architecture to Neo-Davidsonian semantics is the selection of these two hidden states. So now I'll explain what I mean by a Neo-Davidsonian event representation and why I call this a neural Davidsonian architecture. So in a classical non-Davidsonian representation, um, this sentence would look something like this logical form here. So we have a predicate, eat, and two arguments, the cat and the rat. Now the key insight of Davidsonian semantics is reifying the event into an event variable e so that other information about that event, such as its time, location, manner, and so forth, can be easily tacked on with additional conjunctions. But the core roles are still determined by the original arity of the predicate. Now, in a fully Neo-Davidsonian representation, uh, we don't need to worry about uh, the event predicate's arity uh, because we can represent the argument's roles with separate predicates. So we have a separate predicate for the agent uh, and the patient And so in this way, the Neo-Davidsonian representation lends itself nicely to semantic protorole labeling, as we can now break out each property of each argument into its own formula. Um, and so note that each, form, each predicate, um, other than the first one here, has two arguments, the uh, event variable E and the participant. And so this corresponds exactly to our architecture, where we're considering each pair of predicate argument hidden states uh, independently. OK, so I'm going to move on to uh, the experiments and results from this model. Yes. How do you actually determine what the arguments are in the? Uh, yes, um, by syntax. OK, so um, it's like a preprocessor that does some syntax. Yes, so um, uh, I'm using a uh, predicate argument extraction tool that is just a rule-based system uh, that uh, runs on top of the dependency syntax. And it's the same tool that uh, I used for extracting the events, uh, the events in the factuality work. Okay, okay so um, so with this network, uh, we can take advantage of pre-training tasks or multitask training uh, in two ways. So the first is at the BiLSTM level, uh, and the second is at the classification level, or the classification layer. OK, so at the BiLSTM level, I ran uh, several multitask experiments with various related semantic tasks. Um, including prop bank, semantic role labeling, uh, word net supersense disambiguation, and English French translation, where we're going to use the, uh, the encoder as the uh, source side in an English French translation system. So it turns out that the best multitask experiments here um, worked well with uh, translation, and so that's what I'll show uh, the results for here. OK, so here are the overall results on the uh, semantic protorole labeling task uh, as measured by uh, F1 measure. And so we're looking at both the micro-averaged and macro-averaged F1 um, across all of the protorole properties. Um, in orange and yellow are the two baselines from prior work. These are non-neural models. Um, and then green is the vanilla version of the neural Davidsonian model. Um, without any multitask training. And so this simple model is achieving um, state of the art on the semantic protorole labeling task um, without any pre training or multitask training. Um, and we're getting about a half a point on micro averaged and three and a half points on macro averaged. Um, and this is because the biggest gains are coming from the rarest properties. Um, now in maroon, we have the results of the best multitask setting, uh, which was the English French translation. 
Um, and so from this, we get another bump of about a point or two. So overall, this model has improved the state of the art in semantic proteral labeling by about two to five points. Um, now, of course, we all know that uh, in the past few months, um, there's been a lot of progress in natural language processing on um, uh, pre-training methods for uh, neural sentence encoders. So one advantage of the uh, neural Davidsonian architecture over prior non-neural models is that it will be comparatively easy as uh, better and better pre-trained encoders come out to incorporate those advances. Uh, now, because uh, semantic proteral labeling uh, decomposes roles into individual semantic properties, uh, we can also understand how our model is performing uh, on each of these properties independently. Um, and this gives us a little bit more interpretability uh, of the models than in standard SRL. Um, so to the left of the red bar, we can see that we're getting uh, comparatively smaller gains on the proto-agent uh, proto properties. And then to the right of that bar, we're getting uh, comparatively larger gains on the proto-patient properties. And this has to do with the uh, overall frequency of these properties and also how well the baseline systems were already doing. Uh, now, since SPRL is a multi-label task, um, we could actually think of each, prop each property as corresponding to its own task. So for instance, we could have trained uh, separate models for volition detection or sentience detection and so forth. Um, and so in this way, we can think of the model um, which has both shared and dedicated parameters um, across the uh, semantic proteral properties as a, multi, uh, as a naturally multitask architecture. So I, I tested um, whether or not training this network across all of the properties was actually allowing us to learn uh, new properties with smaller amounts of data. Um, and at least in some, case, uh, in some cases, we found that that was the case. Um, so this is an observation that may help uh, inform future data collection efforts in SPRL. Okay, so now um, I want to transition a little bit. Um, and so the last portion of the talk, I want to uh, touch on a few other components of my work, in particular on uh, common sense knowledge and language, and also uh, detecting bias in NLP systems. Okay, so I'll preface this section with a quote from Jerry Hobbs, who in 1987 writes, um, we use words to talk about the world, therefore to understand what words mean, we must have a prior explication of how we view the world. So in other words, there's sort of a two-way street between language and the real world. On the one hand, we need to know about the world in order to understand language, but on the other hand, we can learn about the world through language. Um, but what's reported in text isn't usually just uh, an unbiased reflection of the real world, so we need to be careful when, uh, when we do this. So a lot of my work in this area on uh, common sense and language focuses on identifying and addressing uh, various issues um, in these tasks uh, that are based both on naturally occurring texts as well as human elicited text. So the first pitfall that I'm going to discuss is uh, just generally being aware of when a common sense task is more or less equivalent to uh, language modeling. Um, and a good example of this is in the case of script induction. So, one, so script in, scripts are uh, one particular form of common sense knowledge, um, and they were introduced by, uh, this work goes back to uh, Schenck and Abelson in the 1970s. Um, and so scripts are structured, a structured form of world knowledge uh, that contain uh, sequen stereotyped sequences of events. Um, and so a classic example of a script is the restaurant script seen here. So we have a sequence of events that happen when one goes to eat at a restaurant. Now, although um, early work encoded uh, these scripts by hand, um, this approach is obviously uh, not scalable or feasible. Um, and so more recently, in, in recent years, um, in NLP, uh, there's been some focus on uh, ways of automatically extracting uh, or learning scripts over large quantities of texts. And so we call this procedure script induction. And a common evaluation for script induction is called the narrative close test. So in the narrative close test, uh, we're going to extract a sequence of events from a single document, and we'll remove one of those events. And then the goal is to predict, uh, predict the missing event. So in my work on script induction, um, I observed that this evaluation was really uh, basically a language modeling task in disguise. Um, and so by training, just by simply training a specialized language model for this task, uh, 
um, we were able to see a relative improvement of over 20% on uh, overall prior script induction work. Um, and in the process raised uh, important questions about what is actually the best way to evaluate the task of script induction and did the does the narrative closed task, which is really a language modeling evaluation, uh, match the original goals of script induction. Uh, so the second issue that we've identified um, is this issue of so-called uh, hypothesis-only biases, um, which is relevant to certain data sets in the task of natural language inference. Um, and of course, there's uh, related work on this here. Uh, so natural language inference, uh, or alternately uh, recognizing textual entailment, is an inference task that's framed as a sentence pair classification task. So given a premise sentence, uh, we want to decide whether or not a human reading that premise would then conclude that a follow-up hypothesis is uh, true or not. And the Stanford Natural Language Inference Dataset, or SNLI, uh, has become one of the standard benchmarks for this task with about a half a million training pairs. Um, and the way it was constructed was by showing crowdsource workers uh, sentences from image captions and then asking them to generate three hypothesis sentences. Uh, one that's entailed, one that's contradicted, and one that's neutral. And some of my colleagues and I noticed that um, it was actually possible to predict with very high accuracy uh, the entailment labels in SNLI um, without actually allowing the model to look at, uh, prem at the premise sentences. Uh, and this is in parallel with a couple other groups, including one here, uh, that, that made similar, very similar discovery. Um, so this, this observation means that some portion of the uh, performance gains seen on the task of natural language inference uh, over the past few years were actually due to um, exploiting irregular signals in the data set that were due to, its, due to the nature of its construction by elicitation. Now, uh, directly elicited inference data sets have another known problem, um, which was observed by McRae et al. in 2005. And this is a sort of problem of uh, the limited recall of human elicitation, which is to say that in a particular situation, there is uh, an unlimited number of inferences that can be true. Uh, but when you elicit uh, those inferences from humans, they're only going to reply with a certain limited set of, of inferences. Um, but, but the number of inferences that they can verify to be true is much, much greater. Okay, so rather than using um, direct elicitation from humans to construct inference data sets, uh, one of the things that I've worked on is an alternative method of inference data set construction that's going to attempt to address both of these shortcomings, the hypothesis only and uh, the limits to recall of human elicitation. Um, that's going to try to, to address both of these problems uh, simultaneously. And so the idea here is that we're going to automatically generate or overgenerate many, many possible inferences uh, from a language model given a particular context. And then uh, we'll use human annotators to filter and verify um, whether or not those possible inferences are good or not because humans uh, uh, are, are very good at uh, verification. Uh, and so uh, we did this through uh, constructing a data set called the Johns Hopkins Ordinal Common Sense uh, Inference Data Set, or JOSI. And the idea here is that uh, given a premise, um, I've trained a, a conditional language model that we can sample possible inferences from um, uh, and generate possible hypotheses, uh, and then post hoc use human annotators to apply a subjective likelihood rating on a scale, on an ordinal scale from one to five, uh, to determine whether or not those inferences are actually good inferences or not. Um, and so uh, one thing that we actually see here is this sort of preemptively resolves some of the hypothesis only issues um, when we compare to, uh, this, uh, to SNLI, we see there's a huge gap uh, between the majority class and hypothesis only baselines in SNLI, which is exactly the hypothesis only bias. Um, and that gap is much, much smaller in JOSI. Um, and of course, there's been uh, related follow-up work, uh, uh, really great work here on SWAG that I think is very closely related in spirit. Uh, 
Um, OK, so lastly, I'm going to uh, touch on some of my work uh, in detecting undesirable social or gender biases that are acquired in NLP systems. Um, and we'll see that this can occur in both uh, the distributions of naturally occurring texts as well as human elicited texts. So um, in addition to the st statistical irregularities in SNLI that I've already discussed, um, I also have some work that observes uh, this popular data set that contains um, substantial social biases as well. So by looking at uh, highly associated terms in the data set by uh, pointwise mutual information, we can detect uh, strong implicit associations and stereotypes as seen on the left. Um, and some number of instances in this data set actually uh, explicitly contain uh, preju prejudicial statements uh, as seen on the right. So it turns out that uh, asking, uh, eliciting uh, neutral inferences um, in, an, uh, in an unconstrained fashion um, has a tendency to elicit uh, uh, annotators to just write out stereotypes. Um, so because uh, this is an inference data set, it's uh, actually quite important that we be aware of whether or not the systems that are trained on it are going to be learning to make prejudiced inferences or not. Um, okay, and then so most recently, uh, or so in this past year, um, in the uh, task of co-reference resolution, um, it's, uh, I also uh, developed a task that determined uh, that detected the presence of very strong uh, gender bias in co-reference resolution uh, data sets. Um, this is the uh, winner gender schemas. Um, and so what we see here is that the bottom two sentences, co-reference resolution systems, are unable to uh, detect that, for example, nurses can be male or, um, or uh, doctors can be female, uh, even when the uh, context and common sense dictates that it must be the case in the sentence. And of course, uh, we have, uh, and of course, there is uh, parallel work here um, by Zhao et al. in 2018 uh, making very similar discoveries. Um, and what's very interesting about this is that the errors that the uh, co reference resolution systems make with respect to uh, occupations and uh, gender pronouns um, are correlated with real world occupational statistics. Um, but they also uh, amplify and overgeneralize those occupational statistics. Um, so these biases uh, impact real-world products that have millions of users. Uh, and so even in just the past few months, uh, Google has announced uh, changes to its translation and Smart Compose services uh, to mitigate these problems with respect to uh, gendered pronouns. Uh, and finally, most recently, um, I've been leading a collaboration between researchers at my home institution, at Johns Hopkins and NYU, on detecting complex social biases in uh, pre-trained sentence encoders. Um, and as preliminary work, we've adopted uh, the word embedding association test, which measures um, bias in word embeddings, uh, and adapted that test to full sentence embeddings. Um, but since sentence embeddings uh, capture more complex semantics than word embeddings, um, we believe that more complex social biases, such as intersectional biases or double bind expectations, um, we might be able to detect those in, in the encoder, the sentence embedding representations. Um, however, we also conclude, concluded that uh, simply adapting the word embedding association tests for sentence embeddings doesn't necessarily capture the full story, so there's a lot more work to be done on this particular problem. Okay, so to wrap up, um, the contributions that I've discussed here today um, are on events and participants. So we have two new data sets for the task of event factuality and semantic proteroles, um, as well as an investigation of multitask neural models uh, for these two tasks with state-of-the-art results. Um, and I've also discussed various issues with uh, common sense and language data sets, um, both uh, uh, statistical biases as well as uh, social and gender biases um, in the tasks of script induction, natural language inference, uh, co-reference resolution, and in pre-trained encoders. Uh, so that's all I have, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.